Then. So uh, welcome everybody to the webinar of today. Uh, the talk of today uh, is about drug reduction uh, assisted demulsification in uh, microchannels and the speaker of today is Theodor uh, uh, Burgelea. So as usual I introduce the speaker very uh, rapidly and then I leave him the floor. So uh, Dr. Theodor uh, uh, Burgelea has obtained his uh, BSc degree in uh, 1997 uh, from uh, Dunarea de, de Jos uh, University in Galati in Romania in uh, mathematical physics and his uh, MSc degree in 1999 from the same university in a joint program with uh, Université Bordeaux -Ain in Bordeaux in France. In uh, 2005, he has obtained his uh, PhD degree from the Department uh, of uh, Physics and Complex Systems at the Weizmann Institute for, uh, of Science. And between 2005 and 2008, uh, he did his first postdoc at UBC in Canada. And between 2008 and 2010, his second uh, postdoc at uh, University of Erlangen uh, in uh, Germany. Since 2010, he has been a member of uh, LTN uh, uni uh, Nantes Université, uh, which he joined as a CNRS uh, researcher. Uh, Dr. Burgelea got his uh, HDR in 2017, and in 2020, he co-edited the book Transport Phenomena in Complex Fluids, together with uh, um, uh, Wolfgang Bertola. Uh, he's uh, associate editor of uh, theoretical and computational fluid dynamics and has recently been appointed uh, Erskine Fellow at the uh, School of Mathematics and Statistics of the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. His research interests range from uh, mixing uh, complex fluids, uh, elastic turbulence and uh, emulsions and uh, uh, more, than, more than this. So I, um, it was a pleasure to, to have introduced uh, Theodor Burgelea for the uh, uh, webinar and for the speech he's going to give. So Theo, I stop sharing my screen. You can start sharing yours and I leave you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Great, we see your screen. Yeah, I'm trying to hide this one. Okay. Yeah, uh, so thanks Francesco for, for the introduction. It's really a pleasure uh, being here. It was quite a, lot intro a long introduction and somehow it, it reminded me I'm no longer a young man. So I was trying to conceal that, but if you if you already wrote the the key year 1999, I can no longer conceal that. But anyway, bear with me uh, to, to to keep introducing myself. Uh, there is a part uh, uh, that didn't fit in that small abstract Francesco shared with you. So uh, since I came to to Nantes to Laboratoire de Thermique Energie de Nantes, uh, I came in 2010. Uh, there are a lot of interesting activities going on, but uh, next to nothing related to, to complex fluids. So when CNRS hired me, that was, uh, um, well, essentially my, my research project to, to, to start building some activity around complex fluids. Uh, and of course, uh, there was um, some sort of uh, local requirement and uh, to integrate my, my own interest with the lab itself. I, I had somehow to, to start enjoying some more applied perspectives. So that's why in a nutshell, what I'm doing uh, since 2010, I'm calling it generically uh, transport phenomena in, uh, in uh, complex systems, in complex uh, fluids. And this keyword transport phenomena actually is simply there because uh, besides uh, from the fundamental issues uh, related like why something happens this way we are also trying to to fit in some practical applications somehow to optimize mixing problems or to transport heat more efficiently and things like that which are more down to earth um, the intellectual uh, fund does not disappear it's it's still there but it has to be somehow combined with some more practical interests uh so uh what i what i would like to talk today uh it's about uh, how to emulsify, to produce emulsifications, in, uh, uh, and not just anyhow. I mean, we all know how to emulsify uh, in a batch. I mean, we just steer it strongly and we get our mayonnaise. That's, that's fine. I mean, uh, we would like some uh, 
uh, two important requirements. We'd like something continuous emulsification. So we'd like a device that can work uh, during the weekend while we spend a nice time, with, nice quality time with our family, and we come to collect the results sometimes um, on Monday. Uh, and a second requirement, we would also like um, a rather high throughput. So we would like to emulsify not nanoliters per hour, but eventually milliliters or tens of milliliters or even more. So th that was roughly the setting, um, the applied part of the project. Uh, of course, one of the things that um, that immediately came up, uh, and you are going to see it in, in in a more obvious manner through through this presentation, is that these things are a bit costly in energy. Uh, so, because we are going to to have a keyword turbulent flows, so there will be plenty of energy losses. And the question was: Is there any way, maybe by engineering the molecular structure of fluid, maybe by doing something with the fluid itself, adding a little bit of polymers, or we will see what, uh, to try to tackle these energy costs while not compromising too much the quality of the final product. So that was roughly the setting. Uh, so this work was mainly done by uh, my PhD student, Elia Misi, uh, for, uh, a, a former postdoc who's now in Hong Kong, Young Bingji, has uh, contributed some parts of this um, uh, and the, of this uh, uh, work, and then um, there were there was a couple of co-supervisor Agnès Montier from uh, GPOA from uh, Saint Nazaire University of Nantes, Jean Belletre in uh, the same lab as myself, and we have a collaboration in Italy, Patrizio Massoli. Uh, so that's roughly the the background. Uh, so again, the main quest I, I already stated it, stated it. We want to produce as fine as possible, but at very high throughput and in a continuous manner. So some sort of inline emulsification, no batch, no cleaning uh, beakers, no nothing alike. And of course, we would like to to try to find ways to reduce the associated energy cost. Uh, and the idea was uh, to try to play with the rheology of the fluid, so to to try to use a continuous phase, not something like uh, water or something like uh, uh, zero, but to make the fluid shear thinning in the first place. And now, if we try to so if we try to have a quick glance at what would happen at high Reynolds numbers in turbulent flows for such a mixture. Well, uh, there are many, many. It's rather, it's, it's a rather complicated process. This movie lasts six milliseconds, by the way. It's a very short, it's a very short movie, and the intellectual challenges come from the fact that we have a coupling between a highly nonlinear flow. It's an inertially turbulent flow, uh, and some rheological nonlinearity. I mean, uh, our continuous phase is not really like water, with a viscosity that is a constant, a number one millipascal second or ten. Uh, but it's a fluid that uh, exhibits shear thinning, becomes less viscous when uh, the applied stresses are increased. Uh, there is also, so these are the intellectual challenges because problems with two sources of nonlinearity coupled they are not the best, the easiest things to, to tackle. Uh, there are some practical challenges. Uh, well, the high Reynolds numbers in microchannels. Uh, it means we need very fast flows of orders of meter per second. And these are not very easy to generate. Uh, and uh, if you really want to tell something about this flow, well, you have to, to really be able to resolve microscopic scale. So you need some sort of rather special imaging system. Uh, an iPhone camera or a mobile phone camera won't do it for you. Uh, so these are a couple of uh, challenges. Uh, so how do we turn this fluid non-Newtonian gradually? So we add uh, a polymer molecule. We, it's a biopolymer. It's a uh, hydrocolloid. It, it's called xanthan gum. It's produced by a bacteria, basically. Uh, and well, that's a molecular structure. Don't ask me the details. I can only tell you that uh, on the top, it's the unit being repeated. Now, different suppliers actually have a different coordination number N. That's why on the on the market you have to be careful what is the molecular weight, how many repetitions of that red unit you have. You may have molar masses from uh, something like two million up to fifteen million. You have to be careful about that. And then there are some chemically active groups here with these radicals R one, R two, R three. 
which are very important because basically they can couple to salts, to ions. Uh, they are very sensitive to temperature. They can create, uh, basically they do lead to a, a whole variety of uh, um, <laughs> non-Newtonian rheological behavior. Uh, so prior to study, we, in the beginning, we were very ambitious when we hired our PhD student. We said, okay, we want to study a full emulsification problem. And as you could see in that movie, it means many, many drops doing a lot of complicated things. And then we had a very simple question. We, we said, okay, but, but do we really understand how a single drop, Newtonian drop of oil, let's say, would behave in a turbulent flow field of a shear thinning solution? Just no emulsion, forget about the full real problem, till we at least understand what happens with the toy problem. And the, the main question we would like to understand, how does a drop, a Newtonian drop break in such a flow? It's because breakage is responsible for emulsification, right? Um, and how does the rheology of the continuous phase of the fluid around the drop affect the, the breakup? And what, what drives actually the process? I mean, what is crucial? What is the crucial ingredient controlling the breakup? Something in the velocity fields, so that was, so this setting, it's actually deceptively simple. I mean, it's, it's as that, it's uh, visualizing in real time a single drop and make sure that around it, you, you create a, a turbulent flow of uh, a shear thinning solution. And then of course, compare the behavior for various uh, types of shear thinnings from water, pure water, no shear thinning, then to very high degrees of shear thinning. That was as simple as that. Uh, then, of course, before uh, before uh, looking at what that drop drop droplet would experience, uh, we have to understand a little bit more about the xanthan solutions, this continuous phase, because there is no point of uh, monitoring the behavior if you don't understand what the fluid is rheologically. And to characterize the rheology, rheological properties of this uh, xanthan solution, well, that's also a bit challenging because now I told you we're interested in flows, very fast flows, meters per second. Now, if I tell you, uh, I told you as well that we are interested in micro channels, so very small channels, 600 microns, you can expect that the velocity gradient would be very, very high. Yeah. So what does it mean? It means that we need somehow to measure the rheological properties in a, in a huge range of uh, rates of shear of characteristic velocity gradients. And that you cannot do it solely of, 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 with a classical rheometer. A classical rheometer normally would allow you to work up to 100 seconds minus one, roughly, depending on the viscosity of the fluid, because above this range of values, order of magnitude, you will trigger inertial instabilities during your rheometric test, and then your real, uh, viscosity measurements are worth nothing. You can discard them. And then uh, in order to be able to access such shear rates without, you have to switch from a classical rotational rheometer commercial device to some sort of homemade microfluidic rheometry. And here, if you inject side by side a reference fluid, and a viscous fluid to test, let's say the red one, and you simply measure visually with a digital camera, the position of the interface between them, it's rather easy by stress balance, it's rather easy to show that the ratio of viscosities of your fluid to test and the reference fluid is actually proportional to the ratio of the width of this blue uh, fluid and the red fluid, as simple as that. And now because this is a microfluidic rheometer, basically the width, the total width of this uh, channel goes down to 50 microns, it allows you to measure up to four times 10 to the power five seconds of my seconds minus one. So that's how we we max actually we, with the same fluid we prefer measurements in rotational rheometry than in microfluidic rheometry and we match them. And let's see what what that comes. Uh, so oh so so this is actually well the, the general knowledge in uh, if you Google or you search on the on the web Xanthan solutions rheology the mo the most frequent keyword you are going to get is a shear thinning fluid a Carvajal Suda model so that's roughly the viscosity versus shear rate is that is that so let's so let's see so here I'm displaying on the left depends on viscosity versus the applied stress I convert I switch from shear rates to stresses. Uh, and the four symbols are, 
classical rotational uh, geometry, which you, you can notice that this curve they cut somewhere here, because then I, 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 I'm entering uh, inertial instabilities. And then I, I add the rest of the curve, the empty symbols are measurable for the same concentration, same color of curve, but with microfluidic geometry. So now I can cover a range of stresses, which is roughly, uh, it's uh, nearly four orders of magnitude in stresses. And I can tell you something like six orders of magnitude in shear rates. And now uh, in order to understand the characteristic logical regimes, it's enough to look at the zero shear viscosity. So the location of this full symbols and to plot them versus the example concentration. And we observe uh, some of the things which were rather normal in literature, so some of that G, then uh, above uh, concentration threshold C star uh, semi dilute regime, then even above another scaling regime, a concentrated regime. And what happened next was really, really strange when we increased the concentration past 0.3%, roughly. Uh, well, the life became completely different and not in a good sense because we didn't really understand what happens. So the scaling completely broke down. So this dependent scaling here, it's a lot steeper. It's something like 4.5, power 4.5. We didn't really know what it is, but then when we looked back at our viscosity curves, indeed above 0.3%, there is a clear plateau of viscosity developing at low stresses. And these plateau values are not negligible. They grow 10 to power 3, 1,000 uh, Pascal second. It's huge. It's 1,000 the viscosity of water, yeah? Uh, and then uh, we had this intuition, which was a little bit uh, risky. We said, what if in this regime, actually, we are dealing with a gel, with a weak gel, with an with a eel stress fluid? And that's a really a, a, not a very orthodox guess, because in most of the literature, nobody talks about that. And in order to test that, we had to test this. So what we did, we, we went back to our rotational rheometer and we performed creep tests. So how is it done? You impose a constant stress in your device and you monitor the time dependence of the sample. And you do that for different imposed stresses. So the flow stress is actually the flow stops for the blue curve. Then asymptotically for each higher stress, it enters some sort of a powerless scaling regime. And this is a very simple and neat way of telling from a viscous fluid, uh, your stress fluid. How? If you simply measure the scaling exponent alpha of the deformation with time, at long times, there are two possibilities. If this alpha is one, then if you differentiate it and you get the rate of shear, the velocity gravity, so they are constant. That's a viscous response. So then you have a clear viscosity, well-defined viscosity. On the other hand, if this exponent comes out, if you fit this asymptotic zone, comes out negative, then by differentiation, your shear rate will be proportional to something like a negative power. So what does it mean? It means that in the asymptotic time limit, it, becomes, it goes to zero. So what is that? It's exactly this closed stop which you see here for the blue curve. Well, what does it mean that the, the relative velocities go to zero? It means that this stuff, this material doesn't flow. It behaves like a gel. And now how do I tell gel from fluid? Well, I measure this exponent alpha in a wide range of stresses and for various concentrations. And that's what comes out. So at low concentrations, 0 0.2, for example, the blue symbols, I'm roughly around one. Don't mind the scatter. In experiments, we never have perfect things. There is no perfection. So we are clearly now somewhere for 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Let's watch these triangles. At low stresses, this alpha exponent is smaller than one. Then a critical stress, it becomes one. So what is this critical stress? It's the yield stress. And as you increase this, uh, when you increase the concentration of xanthan, well, this transition becomes even more obvious. So for 1%, that's, you have a huge yield stress, roughly 10 pascals. That's, you cannot miss such a big yield stress. It's a very sticky gel. It's a bit like the uh, sanitary gels we used for so long. So you cannot miss that for a complex, for a Newtonian fluid. 
So now, the, so now basically we can tell something about this fourth uh, weird neurological regime that starts around concentration 0 0.3. That's not a concentration solution. That's not a semi dilute solution. That's not a dilute solution. It's a weak gel. And it's not Karoya Sudan model. You may attempt to fit it with Herschel Barkley if, if you wish, but no Karoya Sudan. So now we know a little bit about our fluids. And obviously, you can guess that through my presentation, I'm going to vary this concentration of uh, continuous phase in this range that I already know it. You can guess that. Uh, now, our system is uh, conceptually very simple. It's a cross lock flow. So there is uh, there are two inlets, yellow and blue. Uh, so inlet one, it's uh, the dispersed phase. We inject oil, simply commercial oil, cooking oil. Uh, on the inlet two, we inject the continuous phase, which can be water or xanthan solutions. Of course, we always inject water because it's our reference. We want to compare things with water. Uh, and there is something uh, interesting about this device because if you look now in a different cross section in the third direction here, perpendicular to this direction, well, the two uh, channel inlets actually are uneven. So one of them is 300 microns, the other one is 600. So what does it mean? You get here some sort of an impingement region where you create a vortex, even in a steady state, because you simply inject the fluids at different levels. So you create some sort of a vortex, which uh, and why we did that, because normally vortices are a lot easier to destabilize. And we wanted to destabilize things to trigger turbulence as early as we can. So that was roughly the end to break, to create final emotions. Now, uh, the data acquisition system, it's also very simple conceptually, but I have to tell you that uh, all together here, it's uh, the price of a very fancy car. So it's simple conceptually, but very expensive practically to buy uh, because of two key elements. So there are two special pumps that can go something uh, for each inlet. They can go something to 50 bars. It's a huge pressure to, to apply to a microchannel. Uh, the microchannel itself is armored. So it's built in between aluminum slabs. It's a bit, uh, it has a design of a small tank, of a micro tank to sustain such high pressures. Uh, and then the... What makes really the car, the price of the car so high is this uh, special camera. It's a very fast camera with equipped with uh, um, a, um, a digital intensifier and it can shoot frames continuously up to 550,000 images per second. So it's a huge frame rate. And of course, in huge frame rate, you need a huge, a very good image intensifier because you, you need a lot of light. And that's roughly the, the, the setup. It's conceptually simple, but in reality, not very easy to, to set in place. Uh, so in terms of analysis for a single drop problem, the most obvious thing you can do, you can visualize a droplet with a, a bit of image processing, you can extract the contour. So we are doing this on a regular basis in the house. We we never buy any software for doing that. We just, it's several, several lines of Python code. And once you get that, uh, you can estimate the uh, following Taylor, you can estimate the average deformation of the droplet. You fit it by an ellipsis and you look at this. It's like centricity-like. Uh, and then that's the obvious part. I mean, it's a simple exercise for an undergraduate course. Uh, that is a less trivial part. We wanted at some point through this uh, study, we wanted to tell things about the velocity field. But our original images, they are simply images of a drop. How do we get information about some velocity field around? That's the continuous phase. We don't have tracer particles inside. We don't do micro PAV. Yet we wanted some something about velocity. We can do something. And that's something, it's a bit painful to implement, but it can still be done, is we call it front tracking. So we can actually track points of the contour from one image to the next. And we do some sort of particle tracking of the points and the contour of the drop. So what does it give us? Well, we don't have a full velocity field, of course. But we have the velocity field everywhere around the contour. 
of the drop. And this can help us to, to tell what controls the formation of the drop. Why? Because then we can compute the second invariant of the rate of the formation tensor. It's D2. We are in two, in two dimensions. Okay, We don't see third component. And then we can compute the flow time parameter. It's a non-dimensional number, which is simply D2 minus magnitude of vorticity divided by D2 plus magnitude of vorticity. And uh, now, if we look at the values of this uh, lambda, well, uh, when it's zero, the flow is dominated by shear, by shearing motion. When it approaches one, it's dominated by extension. And that's how we can. Uh, and then, of course, if we, if we weight average this values of D2 with lambda, we can estimate how much extensions in seconds minus one I have, what, is my rates, what are my rates of extension in the flow, and what are my shear rates. And then I can tell what flow dominates. So that's roughly probably the only challenging um, um, part of the methods. So now we can, we can simply illustrate dynamics of a single uh, Newtonian drop in such a turbulent shear thinning matrix. And the first thing that happens there, uh, such a drop can get trapped. So this impingement, impingement region basically generates a vortex. There are uh, zones of low pressure, right? And in this vortex, in these red squares, the droplet can be trapped. And now by monitoring, by following individual, a single drop in, in uh, successive positions and coloring each position by the value of the deformation parameter, we also have a history, a trajectory of the drop, but also a history of deformations, okay? And that's what happens compared from water on the top, 0.05%. So this trajectory somehow became a lot uh, less complex than the water one. Something really inhibits the complexity of the trajectory. And that's 0.1%. Uh, we can do more than that. Uh, we can lo look at the probability distribution functions of the drop deformations, this parameter dp. And well, uh, they are centered around at low values for uh, for water. So water is somehow a little bit stiff, doesn't really like to, so probably capillarity doesn't really allow deformation very easily. 0.05%, uh, there is an increase of deformation level, of average deformation, uh, but the distribution is still unimodal. I mean, there is a clear maximum. Uh, for 0 0.1 degrees, somehow for 0 0.1 uh, percent, uh, the distribution becomes bimodal. And again, the overall deformation shifts, seems to shift to the right. So this looks like uh, shear thinning, more shear thinning the fluid is, more deformations we're getting in, we are getting into the system. Now, if I try to plot the, uh, the time, the, the drop remains trapped in the vortex because I can count how many milliseconds or fractions of milliseconds, I'm staying in the impingement region. Well, this time actually is proportional to uh, the concentration of Xanthan. So when I increase the concentration, basically I'm favorizing a little bit the, the trapping. And so is the average deformation, the time average deformation, the, the red on the red uh, right axis. It increases more or less with uh, Xanthan concentration. So the first thing that can happen to a drop, that was our question, is that it can get trapped. Uh, that's the statistics of this trapping at various concentrations. Uh, now, if I look at the probability, this uh, of, of, uh, not distribution, the, simply the probability, I count traffic events, okay? Uh, something interesting, and I play with the flow rates. I play with the driving flow rates, meaning I increase Reynolds number, roughly. So at low flow rates, this probability is decreases monotonically with concentration. So, so it means that higher concentration, less probable tracking. Now at high flow rates, there is some coupling in between the inertia of the flow and the non-Newtonian non, uh, rheology. These distributions are no longer monotonic. For high flow rates, it's a bit difficult to say they are monotonic. So, uh, so indeed, there is some complex uh, thing happening even with this very simple setup of a single drop. We have only one drop. And the only thing we do the statistics, we look many, many times at its behavior. Uh, now, what controls the trapping? I mean, if I want somehow to, to control, to pilot these trapping events, 
what would be a right control parameter for the trapping events? So uh, we're defining some sort of kinematic uh, parameter by equation one, which takes as input the inlet velocity squared. It's an energy ratio and the outlet velocity squared. And we call it like strength of the swelling flow. Yeah? And then we correct this by accounting for the non-Newtonian rheology. So we, we divide, we, we take this non-dimensional ratio, water viscosity divided by the uh, exam time solution viscosity. And if we plot all our trapping probabilities versus this effective uh, strength of the swelling flow, well, there is no trapping below 0 0.1 then water falls completely, it belongs to a completely different movie. It never falls on any of the scaling. But that's surprisingly, uh, the rest of concentrations we explore, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 15, 0 0.2, they tend to align more or less up to the size of all statistics. You can imagine we don't have here a huge statistics to some sort of a square root dependence, somehow suggesting that these trapping events occur via some sort of an imperfect bifurcation. Uh, so that's uh, one phenomenon, trapping, but this is not really the most important in the context of emulsification. Because again, emulsification means you'd like to break up drops, interfaces. You like to deform interfaces, then to break. So the real uh, thing to look here, probably the most exciting thing, is how a single Newtonian drop uh, breaks in the turbulent flow of shear thinning fluid. Uh, as function of both Reynolds number and, of course, uh, shear thinning rheology. Uh, movie time. So I'm warning you that this movie might be long because I uh, I played with the frame rate, with the artificial frame rate. In reality, it's six milliseconds or four milliseconds, not more. So let's see what happens. So that's uh, the case of a single oil drop in a Newtonian fluid. So everything here is a Newtonian fluid. So that's... So now some catastrophic events are followed, and they appear coming in a cascade, actually. Drop detachments, explosions. The mass is not rigorously conserved because there is a third dimension we don't see in the third dimension. So don't be, don't be worried if you don't conserve the mass. Now, uh, if I acquire the same movie, for example, our solution, the shape, the intermediate shapes of the drops are completely different. We are getting very, very long filaments. So there, this deformations follow a completely different topology. We are getting very long filaments. They, they last rather long times. Okay, there is a breakup, that's true. There will be some secondary drops inside, in between the big mother drops, but not ejected outside. The water was ejecting outside of... Uh, this, in this case, the small droplets, the daughter droplets are generating uh, as fragments, appear as fragments of the filament. Whereas for the water case, they were ejected to the left side mostly from the big drop. So we can see that, uh, uh, the, that, that was, by the way, it's a similar Reynolds number, changing, playing with rheology uh, of the matrix is a life changing. Uh, now, what are what is the statistics of breakup times? So basically, if I count the time since the droplet enters my channel up to the moment it, its first breakup. So what is this time? So of course, we do this for many, many drops. So our students were very, very patient. Uh, they need to get the PhD, of course. And we got basically for that the breakup time versus concentration uh, at, at high flow rates, uh, magenta and red curves, uh, these dependencies are monotonic. So with concentration, so what, what do they tell us? At highest flow rates, it means that higher concentration of exempt and longer it, it takes to break. That's exactly what you have seen in the movies, these long filaments that live longer. Now, things become really strange uh, up uh, for these three concentrations for the green one and for the orange one and for the blue one. There is a peak which develops a non-monotonic behavior and it develops at 0 
percent concentration. And what is this concentration? It's exactly the first onset of concentration regime, the transition from semi-dilute to dilute regime. So some, something dramatic happens when we exit the semi-dilute regime and we enter, uh, we exit the dilute regime, we enter the semi-dilute regime. So that's a key concentration that completely controls the statistics of the break up times. And now uh, there is another, uh, you see this breakup, you can see it, uh, the breakup of a drop, you can see it as a sequence of catastrophic events. It's more or less like a bomb exploding. I mean, you can imagine yourself a singly connected object, a bomb. You trigger it, you, you move. Uh, and it explodes in many, many fragments. And of course, uh, stronger the power of the bomb is, higher the, the speed of this, these fragments is, more uh, uh, bigger is the disaster it causes. And now the question is, if you have such a capillary bomb, and that was exactly the case, let's see what the capillary bombs, how it looks like. So I show you again the water moving as keeping frames. That's how it looks like. That's a capillary bomb. So that's a, that was actually a droplet of oil. During six milliseconds, I'm skipping frames. It spread out many, many fragments. Now the question is, how do you diffuse such a bomb? Can you do something around so the explosion will somehow become less damaging? And all you have to do Let's, in order to answer this question, let me measure the number of simply connected objects. So, of course, if I start with a single drop, I start with one. I have a single drop. And instead of looking at the shape of the drop or the formation of the drop, I count how many drops I see in the field of view. As long as I see one, it's one, one. Done this part. But then when a sequence of explosion events is triggered, then this number increases. Well, for water, which I was calling a capillary bomb, the blue curve, this is dramatic. I mean, uh, this increase with time is very steep. The characteristic times are very short. Now, if I increase gradually the xanthan concentration, I add more and more xanthan, nothing else, just xanthan. And not big amount. We talk here about 0.2%, okay? It's not a huge amount. Then for the highest concentration, 0.2. Well, the breakup is delayed that you know already, I have seen, shown you the movie, this long filament lives long time. And then the stiffness of the dependence hinted by this spline line is a lot smaller, it's a less steep. So basically this bomb, eventually if we would keep increasing the xanthan concentration in the continuous phase, well, this bomb basically can be completely diffused. I mean, there is no more capillary bomb. So, uh, if you compare this, the magnitude of this slope with this slope, it's a ratio of something like 50 times or 20 times. So that's how we diffuse a capillary bomb, use xanthan solutions. But now uh, I would like to look at the statistics of uh, connected objects. So I'm interested in something else. I would like to understand a little bit when a drop breaks and some other simply connected objects are born, daughter objects. Uh, what are these? Drops really like drops or filaments? Because we have seen xanthan creates filaments. And I, some, I wanted somehow to, to start counting to see how many filaments it does and how, how do I tell a drop, something like that, from a filament. And so there's a very easy way. Uh, and so I can simply divide the area, this drop by perimeter squared. And I call this a sphericity parameter. And now if you take the case of a circle, of a perfectly circular object, you'll get one. Uh, if you take something, a very slender filament, you'll get something approaching asymptotically zero. It will, when your drop degenerates to a line, this will be zero. Now, uh, so now uh, all I have to do, I have to look at statistics of this uh, non-dimensional parameter and to see what happens. So at 0% for pure water, the most, the relevant part of the statistics is around one. So what's, what's that? These are drops, right? So water normally produces drops when it breaks. If I have water around, drops are predominant as a shape. Now, as I increase gradually the xanthan concentration, there is a tail here at low values of this felicity parameter that grows on the left. And so what is this tail? Again, if I look, it's around zero, right? A small value, these are filaments. 
So basically more xanthan and more shear thinning in the material becomes, um, well, the morphology of my objects shifts gradually from preferably drops to filaments. So filaments will always appear and statistically they'll be more representative when my matrix is very shear thinning. Uh, so now, now there is a question which uh, why we we came up with this front tracking technique. Uh, well, not only because it's very fun. Uh, I'm not sure for the PhD student, but for me it was really fun. Uh, the, the, there is a precise reason to to do that. Uh, we are uh, interested, actually. We, the question we wanted to, to to address is what is the type of flow that dominates the breakup process. I mean, and that's a very important question. So if I have a drop and I want to break up, break it up quickly and efficiently, what flow should I create around the drop? Shear? Extension? Uh, well, uh, one part of the answer is sure. If that is the drop and I create rigid body rotation, well, this doesn't break a drop, it rotates. So my choices are only two. What's better to, to play with, shear or extension? So what dominates the breakup process in this system? Shear or rotation? And to do that, we compute this uh, non-dimensional flow type parameter. Uh, zero would be shear, one extension. And now if you look at the probability distributions for during the entire history of a single drop, well, you are going to see that always there are a lot more events around one. Of course, the, the shear part is not absent. The, the, there are shearing events, which is normal. It's not a pure flow. But statistically dominant are extensional events. So basically, this flow parameter indicates that the dominant flow during the drop deformation for this flow configuration, it's extension. Uh, so now, if I want to quantify how much extension and how much shear I have, well, I can measure full value of second invariant of rate of strain, B2, and that would be the total deformation, it's the gray curve. Uh, and then using this non-dimensional flow type parameter, I can actually weight this G2 by lambda. And I can tell you how much shear I have, how much, ex how much uh, extension. And you are going to see here that the extensional part is roughly 300,000 times uh, uh, milliseconds minus one. It's roughly the range we can measure with microphysical geometry. Whereas the shear part is about three times less. I mean. Statistically, it accounts for the drop deformation history about three times less. So now we have the full answer to this uh, problem. Whatever happens to a single drop, uh, extensional part of the flow field is really driving it. It's not really the shear. Uh, now, if I look uh, at time averaged values of uh, um, the extensional part, blue curves, uh, sorry, uh, um, Full symbols and the extent and the shear symbols that and the open symbols shear. So for one flow rate, let's say the blue color again, extension systematically larger than the shear, roughly two three times. And same happens for at higher flow rates, the orange curves. The full symbols are extensional part, open symbols are shear part. So that's again what really happens. Now, uh, if I look, uh, uh, if, I'm, if, if I'm interested in the critical extensions corresponding to the primary breakup, well, uh, something a little bit counterintuitive happens. So at low flow rates, the total strain, the total deformation by integrating the strain rates and the time uh, appears to be higher at uh, low flow rates than at high flow rates. So what does it mean? So the flow somehow at uh, low flow rates, I'm accumulating a lot more deformation before breakup. Whereas at very high flow rates, the total deformation is smaller at breakup. So that's what it uh, tells this curve, which is a bit counterintuitive. And again, there is some normal monotonic behavior at low flow rates. And if I look where this peak is, it's exactly a C star where I have to transition from dilute to semi-dilute regime. So here. Uh, 
So now if I want to map, we have seen two types of events. We have seen trapping events and uh, breakup events. Well, some, some drops are lucky. They don't get trapped, they don't break. It may happen. And now if I do statistics, uh, I count events, and I want to see how the droplet radons number, uh, how they relate in a diagram of the effective strill strengths and droplet radons number, these are the states. So we have the blue mode, no trapping, no breakup. There are very few events here. Normally, most of the drops are not that lucky. We have mode B, no trapping, but breakup. So they exit the impingement region, but they break. Then green, trapping, and no breakup. And then the worst fate is reserved to mode D. They first, they get trapped, they swirl a lot, and then they break. And that's all the red points over here. So that's the, the full picture, or at least was, uh, for as much as we could describe it, of, uh, of uh, single drop dynamics. So it's, a, it, 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 it's like a toy situation that actually, it, it's a little irrelevant, practical. I mean, we don't play with single drops, we play with many drops in real life. But yet it's sufficiently complex in, in spite of the setting being very simple. And uh, the key physical insights here is that the droplet trapping and breakup are strongly related to the rheology of the matrix. Uh, and the fate of a single drop is mainly sealed by extension. I mean, if you really want to write models of this, you have to look mostly at the extensional part of the flow field. So now that uh, we warmed up with, uh, well, I still have uh, 10 minutes, so uh, sort of we warmed up. Uh, so that was a toy problem. Uh, deceptively simple, a single drop. Now, let's say we are more and more confident, let's go for the full problem. So the full problem would be inject one foot on one side on one inlet and one foot on the other side. So we have now both phases playing. And the non-dimensional numbers are classical or Reynolds number, Weber number, Onsorge number, inertial capillary time scale, inertial viscous time scales, and Onsorge time scales, which are nanoseconds. You may forget about those. They're very, very small. They don't play here. Uh, now, the first thing to do, it's an X C2 granulometry. So let's run blind some things. We collect our emulsion out of our microchannel. We take it to a different lab. We measure granulometry size. And we measure it, we analyze enough drops in order to have a statistical convergence of the diameters. And then, uh, well, our non, the, the ranges of non-dimensional numbers are, well, ignore all the table, it's a bit big, I know. Uh, focus only on the Reynolds number, the red column, it goes up to 15,000. Yeah. Uh, sometimes for water, for highly viscous fluids, for example, it can go up to 6,000 or 5,000. We are still turbulent. And these are our relevant time scales. Also, again, number you can forget about them. It's very, very, very small nanoseconds. Uh, our things uh, will happen in the inertial comparative over scales comparative to inertial, inertial capillary time scale. Uh, so we are also, we can also ignore a little bit the viscous time scales that are far too big. Uh, and now if I plot the dependence of the mean droplet diameters on the left. Uh, so for example, uh, let's look uh, at a slow flow rate, a, a slow pair of flow rate. So it's Reynolds number right above transition. Uh, th these are the blue symbols. Well, the dependence is non-monotonic. Something really, really weird happens above 0.3%. I don't know if you remember, I said something about yield stress behavior, about uh, those, those range of concentrations. Now, if I keep increasing uh, uh, the flow rates, the real number, this non-monotonic behavior flattens somehow. So this means that adding xanthan basically will progressively bring me to a state, final state, high concentration, more comparable to the initial state, like water-like. Uh, up to the point that when I play with 300 milliliter per minute on the continuous phase, uh, well, I can get that for 0.2% xanthan, I can get something very close in diameter in granulometry as I would get for water. So that could be interesting. It means maybe 
if I have another reason to, to play this game, maybe that's a game I should play. And another reason would be maybe this is energetically more efficient. Uh, and then if I increase even farther the flow rates, uh, well, Reynolds number becomes something like up to 15,000. Well, there is no, 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 no more no, no monotonic depend, dependence. It doesn't matter really Xantan or not Xantan. So basically you are staying, that's something that presents no practical interest and you will always obtain the same emotion. But practically interesting would be to sit somewhere here where you still have a non-monotonic dependence, meaning that, for example, the red and uh, the black curves, meaning that you, if you can play with Xantan and then maybe decrease energy costs by adding Xantan, well, and still get diameters comparative to the water case, maybe that's a game to, to play. Maybe that's a go. Uh, now, the question is, uh, is there any relationship in this between this non-monotonic behavior of diameters and my concentration bounds? Mm, where is the peak? Somewhere 0.1%. Do I see here 0.1%? Yes, I see it over here. Sorry for the log scale here, it's linear. So that's the transition between semi-dilute regime and concentrated regime. So this appears rather clearly all here. Then when this weird data happened, appears, these points, last points at high concentration, 0, 3 and 0, 4, which don't follow any of this previous trend, where are they appearing? About 0 0.3 and 0 0.3 is 2, 3. It's exactly the bound of the yield stress regime. So yield stress actually does something completely different. Let's see what. Uh, but first, um, I was trying to, to sell the idea maybe it's good to work in this regime with red points and black points. That would be good, adding Xantan, only if adding 0.2% of Xantan could somehow reduce my energy losses. Let's see if I, so what I have to do now, I really have to, uh, to look at the pressure drops versus Reynolds number. Uh, well, they are linear up one offset then they become super linear. That onset is the onset of inertial instability. And for all Xantan concentrations, it's roughly 1,100 Reynolds in, in, for our channel. Uh, and now, uh, if I want to compute a flow resistance, what would I do? I would normalize this pressure dependencies by the laminar part, by the linear part. And then I put them all on a plot. And that's what I get. So how do I read this plot? Uh, well, that's the water case, the up triangles. So steeper is this curve, more energy losses I have in the flow, higher flow resistance. And now what happens when I shift the colors, I go to yellow, that's the highest Xantan concentration. This curves shift down. It means that my relative increase of flow resistance diminishes. What we think is that, is drug reduction. So actually we are winning energetically because we are observing the phenomenon, phenomenon of drug reduction. And now if I go back to this idea here, yes, I would like to add 0 0.2 Xantan to still have along the red curve, at least flow rate, more or less similar diameters, but because drug reduction exists here, I win energetically. So it's a win-win situation. But now uh, if I want to comp to, to, to plot the relative drug reduction uh, versus relative to water, of course, water has no drug reduction versus Reynolds number. That's what comes out. So you can see we can gain roughly 50% in drug reduction or 0.5% Xanta. Water, that's the reference water, it's zero. And it's monotonic with Xanta concentration. So if I can still get good granulometry along the yellow points, it's a nice thing to do. Drug reduction would help me. Uh, now, what are actually the dispersion modes? So if I play with Reynolds number and in all possible ways and with the concentration of Xantan, what types of fluid fluid interfaces I see? So here white, it's oil. Whatever is not white, it's the continuous phase, Xantan solution or water. So a first type of interface, it's parallel flow. Uh, if I want to animate it, it's not much happening. So that's low Reynolds number. Uh, it's a parallel flow. Uh, then at higher Reynolds numbers, I'm getting thick filaments. 
something like that. But even a, a third mode, which is rather peculiar, uh, is thick filaments with branches in between them. So now, uh, if you look carefully, there are thick filaments here connected by some branches. So these bridges between filaments actually are reinforced by what? By the presence of yield stress. In this regime, I'm going to show you, we are in the yield stress regime. Then we have thin filaments. So we may have then, sorry, uh, we may have then thin filaments over here. Then we can make a fixed mode, it's collections of slugs and large drops. And then that's what an engineer would like the most. It's clouds of small drops. That's when good emulsification happens. For me, it's the worst because here, due to the camera resolution, I can't see individual drops. So I'm seeing a white sea, a milky picture. In terms of analysis, I don't like that picture. But if I think I, I look at it as an engineer, I like it because it means I'm getting very good and uniform emulsion. Uh, so um, now, if I want to arrange all these possible modes over Reynolds numbers and concentrations, uh, well, the blue uh, the blue ones are uh, mode one. It's over here, part of the flow. It's over here. Mode two, I don't know if you notice, it doesn't exist below 0 0.05. That's exactly the first overlap concentration C star. Uh, mode three, it's only this short segment above 0 0.3. These are branched filaments. So these filaments with branches in between them, they exist only in the yield stress regime. If you have no yield stress, you don't see that. Uh, then mode four, strongly non-monotonic. Uh, these are thin filaments. Again, they bear information about concentration, 0 0.05 here and 0, 0 0.3, another maximum. That everything is related to concentrations. Then mode five, again, has a peak at yield stress onset. And mode six, it's the small drops here. It should exist over here as well. We can't see them because here we need very high pressures to drive the pumps and we couldn't go below above 50 bars. But normally you should imagine that these uh, red squares, they should exist at high Reynolds number regardless of the concentration. In the end, everything becomes a small drop at high Reynolds number. Uh, now, uh, if I want to, to see the correlation one to one with the rheology, I put them one below the other. And now you can see exactly zero one where it stands. It's a, an inflection of a point here. Uh, zero point three, it's the starting point of uh, the stars, the yield stress branch. It's uh, mode three, maxima for mode four and mode five. So, uh, we, whatever we do, we can't ignore the correlation between this panorama of flow states and the rheology. So the rheology really controls. Uh, so if you want a particular state, a particular mode, I can tell you what concentration to pick up and what pressure to put in the pumps. I can, we can do that. Uh, now, uh, I want to understand a little bit about the dynamics of the interfaces. So I'm building from this uh, sequence of imaging, images, space-time diagrams. I'm applying the single line versus many, many times. And that's how in a space-time um, presentation, the modes look like mode one, mode two, mode three, mode four, and mode five small droplets. And what I can extract here, I can uh, compute correlation times around the center line of the channel. And that's how they look, the correlation functions. And the only thing I would tell you that these correlation times where these functions cross zero, they shift a little bit to the right with increasing xanthan concentration. So this means my filaments we have seen, my drops survive longer with xanthan. So here actually the correlation times will increase a little bit with xanthan concentration. And the last thing I'm going to show for today are power spectra of the fluctuations of interface. Okay, they are not velocity power spectra. They have something to do with velocity power spectra, but they are not velocity power spectra. And in water, well, there are three slopes that pop up with some sort of an indicator of uh, uh, inertial range of minus 5.3. 5, then there is something like a viscous range, very steep, minus 6, or even steeper than minus 6. And there is some range we don't really understand, minus 3.5, the blue ones. Uh, the only 
type of spectra I have seen showing a scaling as minus three something uh, are spectra in bubbly flows. So turbulent flows containing bubbles. People have measured this. Honestly, what is the interpretation? I know not, and I'm not going to make it. But there is a last statement I'm going to do now. If you look at the values of these power fluctuations, I'm starting here from 10 to power 4 somewhere in the range. I'm gradually decreasing. So now if you imagine I would integrate this spectra, the total energy put in these fluctuations actually will decrease with increasing xanthan concentration. So what's that? It means that more xanthan I have in the solution, my flow somehow becomes laminarized. I mean, the, the, the power put in the fluctuations goes down. Does it make sense in the context of drug reduction? I think yes. That's what we would expect from drug reduction, a decrease in the level of fluctuations, associated, of course, through a decrease in flow resistance. And now to conclude, uh, playing with the rheology, actually, of the continuous phase may be rewarding, actually. Uh, up to some point, of course, when you get gels and you need to buy new pumps. Uh, so one may get a much comparable granulometry by adding small amounts of xanthan. And the advantage is that we reduce the drug, we reduce actually the, the, the power losses. We reduce the, uh, we, we employ drug reduction and we somehow make the process energetically more efficient. And the shear thinning rheology uh, adds several layers of complexity in, uh, there is a price to pay now. If you want to understand what really happens, uh, there are modes, new modes of dispersion that come from the shifting rheology, and the whole overall picture from a fundamental standpoint becomes a lot more complex. So we are winning on a applied side, engineering side, we are getting something that might be useful, but on a fundamental side, intellectual side, well, we have more things to do. Uh, and with this, I thank you very much, and uh, well, I'm ready for your questions. So thank you, Theo, for uh, the very detailed presentation. So as you just said, let's let's go on with questions. Is there someone there in the seminar room who would like to ask a question? Just uh, go ahead. I don't see the, the seminar room, so you can let me know if there is someone uh, there. Sure, please. Maybe I'm going to ask uh, a very general question. Remember you said uh, why uh, the micro channel are the best way to create an emulsion? Actually, uh, I don't. Why do we go with this technology of micro channel? For you, simply. Oh. You said that the, the goal is to use a lot. Yes. So why? Uh, they're portable. Sorry? They're portable. Oh, okay. So basically, this micro channel. I didn't show you. I should have brought a chip like that. Uh, you can literally put it in the pocket and transport it. You can they are cheap fabricate to produce. The, I mean, the total fabrication cost of that materials included in working hours would be something like 60 euro, maybe. So they are portable, they are cheap, and uh, they are easy to modify. If you would build a long pipe, for example, and then you, for some reason, you want to change the design, uh, that's a bit more difficult. Because you have to machine a long pipe, you have to uh, a micro channel basically changing completely the design uh, takes something like half day, and the costs they stay and that portable. Presumably, is this one is not the efficiency. Of... Um, the efficiency it's uh, well, uh, it turns out that this micro channel is producing the right amount of uh, emulsions for the right applications. So in cosmetics, for example. Uh, we need something like uh, liters per hour, not more. We don't need 100 liters an hour. We need something like liters per hour, and that's exactly what it does. And it's also relatively easy to, okay, here we put it in extreme situations of 10 bars, but you can imagine less viscous fluids. Uh, you can supply the pressures. You can supply them from a compressed air line, which is available in many places. So we get two bars. Uh, in most of the buildings around us, we get two bars. So this means you want to produce an emulsion. Sure, we are not going to produce at 1,000 Pascal seconds viscosity, but millipascal second viscosity, but something like 100 millipascal second viscosity. All I have to do, I bring in the channel, and you connect the tubings to your compressed air. 
Uh, and that's it. You don't have to measure anything. You bring the beaker and you collect the result of the marshal. Okay. Is there someone else who would like to ask a question in the room? Uh, so, yes, please. Oh, go ahead. My question seems a bit uh, out of place, but you, you mentioned that there are multiple uh, molecular weights for xanthan types. Of oh, yeah. What is the effect of that on your results? And your Oh, so no, what I said, so probably I, I phrased it a bit too quick. Uh, so what I said, this kind of molecule uh, is generically described this way with a coordination number N, but now you have to be careful from where you buy it and what batch you buy from a supplier, because uh, one supplier will call it xanthan, but that N can be, I don't know, 10,000. Another supplier will call it still xanthan. It's basically the same formula, but this coordination number is only 5,000. So then basically you have the same chemical identity, the same product, but because these chains are very viscous, then you may have the surprise that one supplier, when you add from one supplier 0.1%, you get a viscosity. If you do the same, with xanthan from a different supplier or from a different batch, you get a 10 times different viscosity. That's the danger. And unfortunately, that's not very easy to know this number. If you call the supplier and you ask, what is this N? What really happens, they hang off the phone. They don't want to tell you that. So that, that was the caution. But for a single batch, if you buy something like 10 kilograms, normally the molecular weight is well distributed, it's rather narrowly distributed. There are no surprises. I mean, uh, the surprises come if you buy different batches from the same supplier or even worse from different suppliers Then hardly. So there are two types, Keltrol, Xanthan Keltrol and the Calzan. Calzan. We studied them both. They are very, very different. And we chose only one, <laughs> of course. Okay, um, and I, I, I do have uh, a question regarding actually the, um, uh, the add of xanthan to, uh, to, to create the polymer polymeric solution that you use for afterwards for the for yes. the Yeah, so um, um, basically you, uh, you kind of identify different modes or different regimes uh, for, uh, for the, um, uh, for the emulsion, uh, and I was wondering how uh, and and basically you present it in a parametric space, which is uh, concentration of xanthan and uh, um, uh, Reynolds number, right? Uh, uh, I guess one second. Let me get let me get to that. Yeah. 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 Perfect. That's that's this one. So uh, uh, what I what I ask myself. Uh, is um, if the the the, the um, difference in the modes can be somehow uh, explained by uh, different uh, uh, characteristic uh, parameters like non-dimensional groups that potentially link uh, the the Weber number, the Bingham number. Because what 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 I was thinking is like the Weber number is supposed to control like interface forces against uh, inertial forces. So basically the size of the droplet and the Bingham number is supposed to control how mm -hmm. difficult it is to deform small droplets. Yeah, let me, let me, let, let me answer this question, or at least a partial answer. Um, but I, I have to show a plot that I did not show it. I wanted to finish before in time, actually. Uh, so, uh, uh, I will try. Uh, uh, are you still seeing my screen? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So if you see, if I plot the mean diameter versus uh, the Onsorge number, well, it's true. I'm not plotting all the modes here, uh, except the use stress mode. They more or less follow a similar trend. So somehow the physics 
is more or less repeatable. Uh, it's just shifting up to the yield stress. Uh, same conclusion I would get if I plot the Weber numbers and the capillary numbers. Again, the yield stress points are not here. Mm -hmm. Whenever I add the yield stress and I go, you see here, for, you already see for that 20 percent, 0.2 and 0 0.15, they already start to jump from the, from the trend. They no longer fit to the trend. So indeed, there is a correlation uh, in the sense that uh, up to uh, semi-dilute, dilute, things go together, then in concentrated and yield stress, um, different descaling breaks down and probably that also changes the modes. I mean, it's associated with the modes as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see, I see. And, uh, okay, okay. Okay, okay, good. Um, Okay, so let's let's see if there is someone else who would like to to ask a question and uh, um, either from uh, from the um, uh, from the room or uh, uh, from the uh, virtual audience. Just feel free to unmute your mic if you want to ask a question. Or uh, Theo, please tell me if there is someone in the room who would like to ask one. Uh, how do I see that? Let me. Oh, ah, in this room, no, yeah, not in this. Room. No, no, I don't see anyone. Actually, okay. one. Uh, it seems that uh, it is the mod six which is more efficient to uh, to create more emulsion. Um. So it is that low concentration. Uh. Well, it's uh, well. Yes. Yes and no. The, the issue is that uh, mod six anyway it exists uh, uh, everywhere. The, the issue with mode six is that you see the Reynolds numbers are above 6,000. Then the pressure drops are huge and the, the energy costs are huge. And the advantage of increasing concentration is that maybe we can get similar diameters uh, with different modes, but in drug reduction regime. So drug reduction actually will somehow smooth them down the energy losses. So that's where the advantage comes from. The minimum drop, drop diameter never decreases, of course. Uh, but the whole catch, I think, is that we can achieve more or less that diameter in the presence of drug reduction rather than without drug reduction. Uh, and that's probably what, particularly if we want to produce uh, emulsion during weeks in a continuous manner, that's probably what we would like to do. Okay. Okay. Um, so is there someone else there who would like to ask a question? No, I don't, no, I don't see anyone. So I think also from, I don't see any question in the uh, virtual audience. So I, I just would like to ask you a last uh, question that's uh, uh, regarding the dynamics you, you observe with the filaments actually. Um, uh, do, do you, uh, yeah, yeah, that's the dynamics of the thin and the thick filaments. Uh, how how the, uh, do, did you see any sort of qualitative difference between them when you um, actually find, uh, when you use concentrations which are uh, uh, higher? I mean, the, the energy related to their, uh, to their interface deformation, does it look like having a, a, a difference between the two cases or it's difficult to tell? Um, it's a bit difficult to tell, I think. <clears throat> it's a bit difficult to tell because, uh, uh, so you see that this, uh, for example, you are thinking about mode two is uh, thick filaments. Uh, you see that they exist in a rather narrow band, yeah. the black stars, the black uh, crosses. That, that in a rather narrow band, it's a bit difficult to tell. And many of them that are confined, actually, it's not very easy to estimate the power there. I see. 
Okay. Yeah, that would be confined. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, we are now trying to. I mean, we have implemented. I didn't show the data for a very simple reason. It's still in progress. We. I want to make sure we validate the technique. Uh, we are now measuring real velocity fluctuations. We are doing uh, a fast micro PAV. We are adding small tracer particles and we are measuring time series of uh, velocity fields. Uh, I would more uh, try to, uh, I would prefer to address this question, which I like very much using real PAV data, not dynamics, not um, space time diagrams of the interface. But probably that's a question we are going to look uh, look at closely. Closely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah because uh, actually, it's always very tricky to to take an interface and uh, deduct like uh, information about the velocities because always like the tangential velocities. Uh, well, uh, it's worse than it, it's worse than tricky. I think uh, in many yes. in many cases <laughs> yes. it's wrong. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's, it becomes rather accurate. Uh, it may become a good hint for velocity only yeah. when you have a more very small part of the drops, because then your drops yeah. somehow mimic the tracer behavior. They they, are, yeah. they yeah. act a little bit like tracers, but when you have uh, filaments and you no, that's uh, <laughs> so I did not make statements about velocity. That's why uh, my statements were somehow evasive. In the sense I said, well, uh, this uh, this uh, scaling laws resemble somehow we see in turbulence, but I did not call them turbulence scaling laws because I'm not sure they can be compared. But that a reminder. That's why I didn't fit any power laws. I just put a guide for the eye just to remind you that in real spectral velocity in turbulent states, you see such scalings. That's what the entire point. Okay. Okay. So thanks a lot uh, uh, for the reply. So is 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 there anyone else uh, who would like to, to oh, ask? I a don't see. Oh, there okay. are still people in the room. There are still people <laughs> in the room. And no, no question. Okay. Okay. So I think uh, then uh, we can. Uh, uh close the the seminar here so thank you very much Theo, for for the very interesting talk and the number of questions you you replied uh as you saw the 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 debate was quite uh, uh quite open and uh, uh that's uh, that that was great thank you very much so thank you for I having me. yeah thanks thanks once again bye everyone see you next week